So uh, I didn't count them myself, but relying on Inspire, I've written 18 papers with Natty. And although I'm not sure it might make me Natty's second most frequent collaborator after Mike Dine. Uh, and if I'd been giving a talk of reminiscences about things we've worked on, I thought about three I probably would have emphasized. One would be our work on world sheet instantons, and then uh, n equals two super Young Mills theory, and then string theory and non-commutative geometry. And maybe if I'd boiled it down to one, I probably would have had to pick n equals two super Young Mills. But I thought rather than reminiscences, it might be more appropriate today to talk about something current. And here there were also a couple of options because Natty and I have written two papers this year, uh, <clears throat> both involving things at the intersection of quantum field theory and condensed matter. So one could have considered a talk on one of those papers, but each one had some difficulty. So the problem with the talk on the second one is that Natty's given a lot of talks about it and can do it much better than I can. And it, anyway, it would be ridiculous for me to do it, especially with Natty here. And I considered somewhat more seriously the first one because I think it would make an interesting talk that I haven't given anywhere, so it would be new, basically. But there was one flaw, which is that I just couldn't see how to make that talk interesting to Natty. <laughs> 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 okay, so uh, I had to do something different. So instead I'll talk about, describe more recent work that in a sense deals with the same problem that we studied in the first paper, but for bosons rather than fermions. So the idea was developed, described in an abstract way in a paper I've written, and I'm currently working with our postdoc Juven Wang and with um, Zhaogang Wen to understand it better and make it more concrete. Now, first of all, in very general terms, the problem is as follows. So you have a material of some kind, possibly a topological insulator, that has a certain group of symmetries. So in the case of the topological insulator, the important symmetries are time reversal and conservation of electric charge. So here I've drawn very schematically, a sample of a topological insulator that you might have in your lab. And the interior of the material is gapped. And the fun, well, the interior of the material is, bulk of the material is gapped, but it's not a trivial gap phase. It's non-trivial in a subtle way. And what's non-trivial about it is that it responds in an unusual way to some external perturbation. So in the case of the topological insulator, the quickest way to explain what's unusual is to imagine probing the system with a magnetic monopole. So you take an external magnetic monopole, you move it from the vacuum into the material, and it has its electric charge shifted by one half. So in this picture, we've got our topological insulator. There's a magnetic monopole outside. Its magnetic charge is one Dirac quantum, but its electric charge is zero. <clears throat> Then we move it inside the topological insulator. Its magnetic charge doesn't change, but its electric charge shifts by E over 2. <clears throat> well, obviously, since electric charge is conserved, when the magnetic monopole has moved inside, a charge minus E over 2 has been transferred to the surface. And there are basically two options. This charge might be spread over the whole surface, or it might be localized in the case of a quasi in the form of a quasi particle. So let's first well, okay. Regardless, we should ask what kind of how does a material manage to support boundary excitations of electric charge one half? So the option that's realized in materials that actually exist in people's labs is that the boundary supports gapless fermions. And then there's a phenomenon that has to do with the Atiyah-Singer index theorem, and for physicists goes back to the work of Jakeev and Rebbe on topological defects in the early 70s, I guess. When there's a net magnetic flux passing through the surface, the gapless fermions have zero modes. And when you quantize the zero modes, the, the, the zero mode operators have integer electric charge, but when you quantize them, you get quantum states of half integer half integer electric charge, 
Uh, Jakiv and Rebbe showed in a problem similar to this one, and also somewhat like what Ramon did in string theory, where his fermion zero modes in the Ramon sector are vectors, but the corresponding states are spinners with half integral angular momentum. And so in this case, uh, the charge E over two is carried by the zero mode wave function, so it's spread over the whole surface. Now, another thing that could happen is that the symmetry could be explicitly or spontaneously broken on the boundary. For example, in the case of the topological insulator, if we did not have electric charge conservation, there would be nothing to discuss. And although it takes a longer explanation, it's also true that uh, the problem would have another solution if you did not have time reversal symmetry. And so, the, a phase of matter such as the one I'm telling you about is said to be symmetry protected. It has subtle properties, in this case the charge one half that a magnetic monopole would acquire if moved inside, but the subtlety disappears if one is allowed to violate the symmetries. Now, there's a third thing which can happen also in theory, although not yet in practice in any known material, which is that keeping the symmetries, it's possible for the boundary to be gapped. But if, <coughs> when, the, when the boundary is gapped in a symmetry-preserving fashion, what happens is that when the magnetic monopole passes through the surface, a quasi-particle of electric charge plus or minus E over 2 is created at the point where it, or very near where the monopole passed through the surface. <coughs> it turns out that in a theory with that microscopically has only integer charges, to have a gap phase with fractionally charged quasi-particles, that phase actually has to be described by a non-trivial topological field theory, which here will be a two plus one dimensional topological field theory that only lives on the surface of the material. Now, I don't have time for a proper explanation, so I'll give a shortcut. We have a quasi-particle of electric charge E over 2 in the boundary. We imagine the boundary is a solid, we imagine the material is a solid torus or something. So there's a non-trivial one cycle in the boundary. We drag our quasi-particle around the boundary, and we'd like to know how the phase of the wave function changes. Well, for an integer charge quasi-particle, electromagnetism tells you that you take the exponential of i times the charge times the vector potential, and that's a well-defined phase that the particle gets in going around the loop. But if the charge was e over 2, then electromagnetism doesn't tell you what to do. You have to take the square root of something that was well-defined, but electromagnetism will not tell you which of the two square roots to take. So what happens instead is that the vacuum has a property that tells you which of the two square roots to take. And since neither one is distinguished, there has to be more than one vacuum state of this material. So it's a gap system with more than one vacuum in a symmetry-preserving fashion. It's a non-trivial topological field theory where the vacuum subtly tells you how to do what electromagnetism won't do alone and assign phases to paths traveled by particles with half-integer electric charge. So that's the best I can do now for very briefly explaining why gapped boundary states that preserve the crucial symmetries are associated to these non-trivial topological field theories. So in our first of the two recent papers, we studied gapped and symmetry-preserving but topologically non-trivial boundary states of a topological insulator or superconductor. So there have been some other papers. <coughs> we gave a treatment where the dynamics was completely explicit and clear. But instead, I'll today be talking about analogous boundary states for gap phases of bosons, which likewise are symmetry-protected topological phases, which, as I've tried to explain, means that the bulk theory is gapped, but has a global symmetry G that in some sense is realized in an unusual fashion, that forces unusual boundary behavior. So for the topological insulator, the symmetry was time reversal and electric charge conservation. And the, there are various things that could have been explained, but the signature I gave you of the unusual behavior was the half integral charge deposited on the surface when a monopole passes through the surface. In our other examples, the symmetry might be different. The unusual behavior is a little bit different. 
but we always have gap phases that are in some sense unusual, <clears throat> and in particular have unusual boundary behavior. Now, there's a systematic approach to such phases, which uses group cohomology and sort of involves applying to this kind of problem what Robert Dygraf and I did a long time ago in Chern Simon's theory for a finite gauge group. But the formulas are a little bit abstract and it's difficult to make them understandable on the fly. And I didn't feel like trying to use my 40 minutes to make you wade through some formulas involving group cohomology. Uh, before the systematic approach was discovered, three of the same authors uh, described a particular example in a very explicit way. They called it the CZX model, a name we'll come to. This was an example with global symmetry Z2 in two space, one time dimension. And it was constructed by hand, not with any fan fancy use of group cohomology. And that comes as a certain cost because it's in two plus one dimensions and some of the important properties really only have their generic behavior starting in three plus one dimensions. Also, uh, following the elementary explicit approach has the virtue that we'll draw pictures instead of talking about cohomology groups, but um, <clears throat> it'll involve a very explicit description of one model rather than a systematic approach to a whole class. So in the long run, the general approach is more powerful, but it's nice to have an explicit intuitive example, and that's what we'll be hearing about today. So I should say that in my work with Wang and Wen, we use the abstract approach as well as the concrete one. Also, here's a reference to a paper describing a gap boundary state for bosons in a special case. Now, our model is going to be on a two-dimensional square lattice, and each lattice site contains four qubits. So these large disks, the, the figure, by the way, is taken from the paper of Wan et al. describing the model. The large disk represents a lattice site, but since each lattice site contains four qubits, inside the large disk are four smaller disks, each of which represents one qubit. And what the squares represent is something we'll get to later. But first, we're going to discuss what there is on a single lattice site. So if we have a qubit, we'll denote its states as 0 and 1. And there is a Z2 symmetry that acts on the four qubits on a site, but the way it acts is a little subtle. So we'll let Xi be the operator that flips the ith qubit. <clears throat> and an obvious Z2 symmetry would be the product of all the Xs, which I'll call X star. But here the Z2 symmetry will be defined a little bit differently. So the Z2 symmetry will act like this times plus or minus one, where the sign will depend on which of the qubits are up or down. So we define an operator Z for any qubit in the one zero basis. And then if we're given two ij, if we're given two qubits i and j, we define the operator CZ sub IJ. Well, I think they called it controlled Z by analogy to things in quantum computer science. So this operator simply acts as follows. If both states, if both qubits are in the one state, it acts as minus one. But on any other basis vector, it acts as plus one. So if A and B are not both one, CZ leaves the state invariant, but it gives a minus one if they're both one. Another way to say it is that if the first qubit is in state one, we measure minus z of the second qubit, and otherwise we do nothing. Now, I've drawn one of those sites, a large disk with four small disks inside, and when you have that picture, the four qubits are in cyclic order. So now we define the total CZ. Uh, throughout these slides, I'm going to use a star to mean a product of a lot of little operators. So the total CZ is the product of the CZ operators in cyclic order. So <clears throat> CZ star gives a minus sign for every pair of adjacent spins that are in the state 1, 1. And then the Z2 operator we define for four qubits is the total CZX. 
it's the operator, the total CZ times the operator that flips all the spins. Remember, X star flips all the spins, and CZ star measures how many pairs of adjacent spins are both in the state one. So it's a little tricky that CZ star squared is one. You have to look at a few special cases. So I drew parentheses here, but imagine a disk surrounding these four sites in cyclic order. So if one spin is one and the other three are zero, then the operator that flips them maps to a zero and three ones. And the number of adjacent ones goes from zero to two, which are both even, so the sign of CZ star doesn't change. And since the sign of CZ star doesn't change, when you compute CZ X star, well, you flipped all the spins twice, and you also got a plus one twice from CZ star, so the square is one. Here's another example. If you have one, one, zero, zero, it maps to zero, zero, one, one. Both of these have CZ star equals minus one. And since CZ star gets squared, so you act with CZ star, get a minus sign, flip all the spins, then you act with CZ star again, get a minus sign, and then flip them back. So the square of the operator is one. And there are one or two more special cases you can check in the same way. So in all cases, CZ X star squared is one because X star exchanges two states with the same eigenvalue of CZ star. Well, this was a long explanation of something which by itself is completely useless. And the reason it's completely useless by itself is that by making a unitary transformation of the four qubits, we could put the Z2 action in a standard form. The reason I've gone to the trouble of describing the Z2 action is that we will have a Hamiltonian and a ground state wave function that are simple in this basis. So the unitary transformation that made the Z2 more obvious would have messed up everything else. So had we diagonalized the Z2 action, it would have been hard to describe the entanglement pattern of the ground state, which we're now going to, which we'll come to in a moment. But before I discuss the entanglement of the ground state, I want to make a general remark about the realization of symmetries. The Z2 action was described in a slightly non-standard fashion, but it was on-site, where on-site means that the qubits at any one lattice site transform separately under their own Z2 symmetry. <clears throat> so now, in condensed matter physics, any microscopic global symmetry is going to be on-site, basically because of the locality of physics. Um, the Hilbert space, you can always think of a tensor product of Hilbert spaces associated to sites. You might want to include many uh, quantum states per atom, but it's not necessary to consider infinitely many. And likewise, the symmetries act on an individual site. That's important because any on-site global symmetry of a lattice system is anomaly free in the sense that it can be gauged. Thus, I haven't picked a Hamiltonian yet, but whatever Z2 Hamiltonian we pick for this system can be coupled to Z2 lattice gauge fields where the lattice gauge fields will live on the links between the sites. So taking this as a site and this as a site, there will be one Z2 gauge field connecting these, one connecting these, and so on. But because of the on-site nature of the symmetry, this Z2 can be gauged. Later, we'll meet a Z2 symmetry that actually isn't on-site and can't be gauged. That's part of why I've emphasized this now. So non-on-site symmetries can be anomalous and ungaugeable. Now, the CZX model has short-range entanglement and, in particular, is gapped. But the entanglement is naturally described not in terms of sites but in terms of plaquettes. So what they call plaquettes are these squares. So just like a site, a plaquette has four qubits, but it has four different qubits. A plaquette has one qubit from each of four different sites. Now, it's easiest to first describe the ground state wave function before describing the Z2 invariant Hamiltonian that has this ground state. If I wrote the Hamiltonian, it would look artificial, but the wave function is very natural. I'm sure they started with the wave function 
and then hunted around for Hamiltonian with that ground state. So the ground state wave function is a product over all plaquettes of a state in which all qubits in that plaquette are either 0 or 1, with amplitude 1 over root 2. So the four qubits in any one plaquette are highly entangled, but there's no entanglement between spins that are not in the same plaquette. So this short range entanglement certainly means that a model with this ground state will be gapped. Now, what, Hamil okay, sorry. what Hamiltonian would have that ground state? Well, there's an obvious Hamiltonian that has that ground state. It's the sum over all plaquettes of an operator that flips all zeros to all ones and all ones to all zeros. It has eigenvalue zero for any state where the four qubits are not equal in a plaquette because it can't flip them. It annihilates such a state because a state where sum are zero and sum are one is orthogonal to this and orthogonal to this, so it's annihilated by H zero. It's an eigenvector with eigenvalue one. The sum of all zero and all one has eigenvalue minus one for H as I've written, and the difference has eigenvalue plus one. So the ground state is the state of all zeros plus all ones. But there's something wrong with that Hamiltonian, which is that it's not Z2 invariant. It has the obvious Z2 symmetry that just flips the spins. But it doesn't have the more subtle Z2 symmetry that we defined. And that's because, let's say we flip the spins in this plaquette. Well, that means we, in particular, flip this spin, but we don't flip these three. So some of the CZ operators linking these two and linking these two will change sign. So the obvious Hamiltonian was actually not Z2 invariant. <clears throat> but we can fix it. So this, is, this picture is not from their paper, so it's not as pretty. <laughs> so, uh, OK. Here I've drawn a plaquette, and I've drawn two adjacent spins that are not in the same plaquette. I've also partly drawn a site that contains these two and a site that contains these two. And suppose we agree that we're only going to flip these four spins if these two are equal. Well, <clears throat> you see, there's a CZ operator here and a CZ operator here, and flipping these four spins might change this one and might change this one, but if these two are equal, they'll change the same way. So if we agree to only flip these four spins when these are equal, then in fact, we do get a Z2 invariant procedure. So for each plaquette P, we let pi sub P be the projector onto states where all the adjacent pairs are equal. And then we take the same Hamiltonian as before, a sum of all plaquettes of what we had before, but we multiply it by pi sub P. So now we have an operator that commutes with CZ X star, and it has the same ground state as before. So now we have found a Z2 invariant model with this funny ground state. So that's the CZX model. Well, <clears throat> in this model, the symmetry action is trivial in the sense that it's on site. And the entanglement pattern of the ground state is also trivial in the sense that it has very short range. In fact, if we ignore the Z2 global symmetry, we could simply regard plaquettes rather than sites as being sites. And then there would be no entanglement except on one site. And that would mean that the wave, ground state wave function would be a trivial product of a wave function at each site. In other words, going back to this picture, if we ignored the symmetry, instead of grouping the spins this way, which we did because, you see, why not group the spins in squares and say that the squares uh, are the sites? In that case, the symmetry would not be on site. So it would contradict the fact that microscopically in condensed matter symmetries are on site. But if we disregarded the symmetry, that would be unimportant. We could declare the squares to be sites, and then we'd have a completely trivial wave function that would be a product of a separate wave function at each site. There would be no communication between the different sites. So 
Both the symmetry and the entanglement individually are trivial, but they're not trivial in the same way. One is trivial for the sites and the other is trivial for the plaquettes. Or one is trivial for one group of four spins, the other is trivial for a different group of four spins. And <clears throat> the fact that the CZX model is in a non-trivial phase of Z2 invariant theories in two plus one dimensions depends upon the subtle mismatch between the entanglement and the symmetry. So, in fact, the symmetry pattern and entanglement pattern cannot be made trivial at once, and the model is in a topologically non-trivial phase of gap systems with Z2 symmetry. Now, we see what's non-trivial most directly if we look at the behavior near the boundary. And here we face the fact that there are different possible boundary states. For example, if you have a material in the lab, you can study what happens at the boundary, or you could add another layer of atoms and study it again. It might be quite different. So I'll first consider the original boundary state, and then I'll describe an alternative that I've been looking at recently with Wang and Wen. Now, let's consider a system with an integer number of sites, all of the type I've described, which actually is wh what I've been drawing throughout. Now, we run into the fact that near the boundary, there are some incomplete plaquettes. The Hamiltonian was a sum of a term for each plaquette, but we don't know what to do for at the boundary. So in the original boundary state, to begin with, we just take zero for the boundary. So we take the Hamiltonian as a sum over complete plaquettes of what it was before. And then we're going to analyze the boundary physics that we get with this Hamiltonian. Well, this makes sense in a Z2 invariant. But now the system is not gapped because the spins on the boundary are not fully constrained. The Hamiltonian on doesn't, well, we'll be more precise in a second. The low energy physics is rather interesting. Let's look at the bottom row consisting of qubits that are not in complete plaquettes. They're not completely free to fluctuate because there was a complete plaquette here. And to minimize the energy, we want to be able to flip the spins in pl that plaquette. But because of the projection operator, we can only do that if these spins are equal. So to minimize the energy, these two spins are equal, and these two spins are equal, and these two spins are equal. But there's no other constraint. So for an effective description, we can use composite qubits with one qubit for every partial plaquette on the boundary. So these two make one composite qubit, these two make one composite qubit, and so on. Now, of course, there's a Z2 symmetry. But the effect of Z2 symmetry for the composite qubits is not on site. The Z2 generator is the product of the operator that flips all the spins. We had that microscopically. But then we need to ask what's left of the CZ operators near the boundary. And we get a CZ operator for each pair of adjacent pair of composite qubits. The reason that happens is that here's a composite qubit, and so is here. But these two are contained in a site. So the microscopic symmetry had a CZ operator for these. And that gives a CZ operator linking this composite qubit with this one. So the effect of Z2 generator flips all the spins, but all the composite spins, but there's also a CZ operator for every adjacent pair of composite qubits. So you can check that the square of this operator is 1, as it might, must be, because microscopically we had a Z2 symmetry. But in the effective boundary theory, it's not one site, because every adjacent pair of composite qubits is linked by a CZ operator, and there's no way to factor the Z2 symmetry as a product of symmetries that act on individual sites. It doesn't matter how many composite qubits you combine together into one site. At the end of the chain, the last one is linked to the next one by another CZ operator. So this is not an on, the effective symmetry of the boundary theory is not an on-site symmetry. And, and we can't make it on-site by combining composite qubits into sites. Now, it can be shown 
that a chain of qubits with this non one side Z2 symmetry cannot be gapped. But you can remove most, see, as I've described it so far, if we have n composite qubits, there are two to the n degenerate states because we had no constraint on the composite qubits. You can definitely add a boundary Hamiltonian that has the Z2 symmetry. You take any Hamiltonian and average it over Z2. And if the average isn't zero, it's a Z2 invariant Hamiltonian. And they give an example that flows to a C equals one theory on the boundary. So the boundary is, has one space and one time dimension. So the boundary theory with a certain perturbation flows to a C equals one system with the Z2 acting as a discrete chiral symmetry. Meaning, well, if you like, the Z2 symmetry acts as T duality on a massless boson. Or, sorry, a discrete chiral symmetry on fermions. And the, the chiral nature of the Z2 symmetry prevents the system from being gappable. Now, there's much more to say about this boundary state, but I want to describe an alternative one. So the alternative state I'll describe will be another boundary state of exactly the same system. To construct it, the first step is just to throw away all the boundary spins that are not in full plaquettes. So luckily there was a picture in the paper, so uh, <laughs> we have a relatively nice looking picture here. So uh, here we've got a bunch of partial sites, but near the boundary we just throw away the spins that are not in complete, sorry, okay. So here I've drawn a system with complete plaquettes only, no partial plaquettes. But having complete plaquettes means that near the boundary we have partial sites. So bulk sites have four qubits as before, but boundary sites only have two qubits. <clears throat> and there even are corner sites, or there, there might be corner sites with one qubit, but we will skip them today and just talk about the boundary sites, generic boundary sites. Now, with the same Hamiltonian as before, the system is now gapped. And the ground state wave function is the same. Now, all the spins are in bulk plaquettes, complete plaquettes. And for each plaquette, we use the same ground state wave function as before. And it's the ground state as the same Hamiltonian as before. So, and moreover, it has the CZX star symmetry if we define this symmetry in a fairly obvious way for the partial sites. A partial site with two spins, we just take the CZ operator for those two spins as part of the definition of CZ X star. Oh, I said this here. Okay. So for a boundary site with two spins, we define CZ X for that site as being the operator that flips the two spins times the CZ operator of those two spins. We need to include the CZ here and then if we do, the total CZX star, defined as a product of raw bulk and boundary states, commutes with the Hamiltonian and generates a global symmetry. So what's wrong? The Hamiltonian is gapped, and it has the symmetry that we started with. But it's no longer true that the square of the symmetry generator is one. For a boundary site I containing two qubits A and B, it's not true any longer that CZX star squared is one. So I showed you uh, earlier that for a complete site, CZX squared is one. But for a boundary site, it's not true that CZX squared is one. I'll call WI CZX squared of the ith boundary site. You could show that it's equal to one if the qubits are opposite and minus one if they're equal. So WI is not one, but a square is one. So now I let W star be the product over the boundary of all the WI operators. So the global symmetry of the system is actually now Z4 because CZX star is a symmetry indeed, but its square is not one. Its square is W star, where W star squared is one, but W star itself is not one. So here, W star is a Z2 symmetry that acts only on the boundary. So we found a system with an emergent Z2 global symmetry on the boundary. So 
Does that make us happy? Well, the bulk symmetry is Z2 generated by CZX star, but along the boundary, the symmetry is enhanced to Z4, and it has a Z2 subgroup that only acts on boundary spins. So this is a Z2 sub, uh, this is an extra Z2 symmetry that we didn't start with, but we found our boundary state had it. Is this physically sensible? Well, in condensed matter physics, one might find emergent global symmetries in the infrared, but they are always approximate symmetries explicitly broken by irrelevant interactions. You're never going to find an exact emergent global symmetry in condensed matter. What's wrong here is that the emergent symmetry will have to be exact because its generator is the square of CZX star, where by hypothesis, CZX star is an exact microscopic Z2 symmetry generator. So we can't break the emergent symmetry. We can't treat it as an asymptotic symmetry in the infrared. It has to be an exact symmetry. And that's unphysical in condensed matter. So we could, as I said, we couldn't explicitly break the new symmetry without also breaking the old symmetry because the new symmetry is now part of the old symmetry, so to speak. There's only one way out. We have to gauge the Z2 symmetry generated by W star. When I say one way out, there's only one way to, or one apparent way to modify the model to make it physically sensible, at least in the context of condensed matter. As a mathematical exercise, it makes sense as I've pre presented it so far. There is a exotic SPT phase with Z2 symmetry. It has a gap symmetry preserving boundary with Z4 global symmetry. But in condensed matter, you don't want emergent global symmetry, so we should gauge the Z2 symmetry. In other words, the full symmetry now is Z4 generated by CZX star, but we're going to gauge the Z2 subgroup generated by CZX star squared. <clears throat> you might worry it can't be done, but actually it's straightforward. I want to stress, though, that in condensed matter, there's no problem to have emergent gauge symmetries that are exact. The canonical example is the fractional quantum Hall effect. Now, gauging the boundary symmetry generated by W star is no problem because this is an on-site symmetry. I think I must have started late. <laughs> <laughs> So we introduce a Z2 gauge field only on the boundary. On each link connecting two boundary sites, we have a Z2 valued field plus or minus one. It's called a lattice gauge field. It's, well, people usually call it U, but I've called it V. So here's, here I've only drawn the boundary. So these are boundary sites, each of which contains two qubits. I label them by integers. I label the links between them by half integers. And each link has a Z2 gauge field which is parallel transport from one end to the other. Since the group is E2, we don't have to distinguish V and V inverse, and we don't have to orient the links. We can think of V as an operator that acts on a new qubit. We can represent it by that matrix whose square is one. We also need a discrete electric field E that flips V. <coughs> e is also Z2 valued, its square is one, <coughs> and it changes the sign of V. And to do gauge theory, we need the Gauss law constraint. The Gauss law constraint says that the state <coughs> is invariant under a gauge transformation acting at any site. Well, a gauge transformation at boundary site I acts on the matter fields by what I call WI, but it also flips the gauge fields at the links just before and after <coughs> the ith site. The operator that flips the gauge fields is E. So, okay, if the site is here, we act by WI, but we also have to flip the gauge fields here and here. So, the constraint operator at site I is WI times the product of the two E's for adjacent links. And in gauge theory, a physical state is invariant under gauge transformations, which for Z2 gauge theory that we're studying now means this. So, as I told you, we could gauge the Z2 emergent symmetry, and it's been done. But the product of all the constraint operators 
is the generator of the emergence E2 because E squared equals 1. In other words, I take the product of all the constraint operators, so I write it out, the E's cancel in pairs, and I'm left with the product of all the W's, and the product of all the W's on the boundary is the Z2 global symmetry generator, the emergent Z2 symmetry generator. So if the lambdas leave the state invariant, so does W star. All I've done is to show you that on a compact manifold, which I've assumed because I didn't worry about ends of the chain, that on a compact manifold, uh, in gauge theory, a total a state is neutral because the flux has nowhere to go. So <clears throat> a physical state is invariant under W star, so the symmetry that acts on physical states collapses from Z4 to the original Z2. So, well, we might feel happy, but we shouldn't rest on our laurels because we're not quite finished. We need to discuss the origin of the Z2 gauge symmetry that was an important part of the construction. And I'm anxious to discuss this because this talk is supposed to end with a small punchline. In condensed matter physics, there are no uh, microscopic gauge symmetries other than electromagnetism, so any other gauge symmetry is emergent. But what exactly does that mean? The following, here's a precise definition of emergent gauge symmetry that was suggested to me by Wen. First of all, in condensed matter physics, not only are the microscopic symmetries on site, but the Hilbert space is on site, meaning that the full Hilbert space is a tensor product of a Hilbert space for the ith site. By the way, the definition of a bosonic system is that this is an ordinary tensor product, not a Z2 graded tensor product. So <clears throat> I didn't say this before, but it was uh, implicit in my definition of an on-site symmetry. So an on-site symmetry is the product of symmetries that act on each HI. So anyway, a true microscopic model in condensed matter physics has the property that the Hilbert space is on-site. But in conventional lattice gauge theory, the Hilbert space is not on site. We introduced a qubit that was associated to a link rather than a point. And there's no way to combine links into points or anything because at the end of the chain, there would always be another link connecting you to the next point. So the Hilbert space in lattice gauge theory is fundamentally not on site. So an emergent gauge theory is a theory that macroscopically, microscopically has an on-site Hilbert space, but at long distances can be described by a gauge theory. So a relatively well-known example of emergent U1 gauge symmetry in 1 plus 1 dimensions is the CPN model. And it can easily be modified to the RPN model to get a model of emergent Z2 gauge symmetry which we can then use in our problem. So if you use that or some other model of emergent Z2 gauge symmetry, finally you get a completely physically sensible version of this model. And when I was planning this talk, I was planning, oh, I should say there are other tricks known to get emergent gauge symmetries on the lattice. When I was planning this talk, I was going to describe this RPN model in detail and I really like it. But I realized that there just might not be enough time and there might be a chairman saying I was out of time. So, uh, since there is a punchline I wanted to get to, I decided to have to skip that. So instead, I'm going to end by pointing out a recent development in string theory slash quantum gravity that has an obvious analogy with what I've just told you. So this involves the eternal two-sided black hole in anti sitter space. So he, here's one asymptotic boundary of space-time. Here's the other asymptotic boundary. Here are the horizons. And here are past and future singularities. But this is the two, meant to be the two-sided black hole that corresponds to the thermofield double of two conformal field theories. Now, the space-time is connected even though the Hilbert space is supposed to be a simple tensor product of Hilbert spaces left and right associated to left and right boundaries. So the con connectivity of the space-time is supposed to come purely from entanglement of the state not from any interaction between the two uh, theories associated to H left and H right. And this is kind of perplexing. And the puzzle was recently sharpened by Harlow, who considered a case in which 
the ADS radius is large, so we can use effective field theory, and there's a gauge field in ADS. And then from a long distance point of view, it makes sense to consider gauge invariant Wilson operators that link the two sides. sides. <coughs> At the ends, they end on operators of the boundary theory that transform under the global symmetry charges. Now, this is a bit of a puzzle because if the Hilbert space is a tensor product, then any operator on the Hilbert space is a sum of products of operators on the left and operators on the right. That's just an algebraic fact about tensor products of two vector spaces. The space of matrices acting on a tensor product, a matrix need not be a simple product of an operator on one and an operator on the other, but it's a sum of such things. And the Wilson operator to the naked eye does not look like it's a sum of products of operators that act on only one side or the other. The resolution that was offered was that to restore factorization, we have to assume that any gauge field in ADS that is in a world of negative cosmological constant is emergent. And then it was argued that if the gauge field, if the gauge theory isn't really there microscopically, but is emergent as in the CPN or RPN models, then an operator that at low energies looks like the Wilson operator can actually be represented as a sum of products. By extension, one expects that this is also true if the cosmological constant is zero or positive. The claim would be that in a world with quantum gravity, all gauge fields are emergent. So the factorization, and this is my punchline, I'm afraid, for better or worse, the factorization of the black hole Hilbert space as H left tensor H right leads to the same conclusion in quantum gravity that the on-site nature of the microscopic Hilbert space plays in condensed matter. It forces any gauge fields to be emergent. With the help of an emergent Z2 gauge field, one can finally complete the construction of a gapped symmetry preserving boundary state for the CZX model. And that's what I have to offer today. Thank you. <laughs> okay, a couple of questions. I think Tom, right? You was the first to raise your hand. Yeah, uh, your Z2 gauge theory, doesn't it have a non-trivial holonomy around yes. the boundary? Yes. So that's something that wasn't there in the original model. Right? Oh, well, uh, as I explained earlier in the talk, when you make a gap symmetry-preserving boundary state, you generally get a, a non-trivial topological field theory on the boundary. And what you're saying is related to that. Uh, but I must tell you that there are some tricks in the story that we don't have time for, and this situation is more generic in one dimension higher. But anyway, uh, condensed matter can have emergent topological field theories, and that's what you're getting at. And condensed matter can have emergent gauge symmetries, which lead to emergent topological field theories. So you cannot have emergent global symmetries. That's unphysical. But what you've pointed out is a correct feature of the model and an interesting one. Although, it, under deeper study, it's more interesting in one dimension higher, but we don't have time. Yes? Okay, Juan? Yeah, so given that the space, so in the context of the black hole and the wormhole, given that the space time is emergent, yes. Well, this is a question for Dan and Hiroshi. <laughs> but I believe the answer has to do that there could be a difference in scales between one and the other. The well, the, the question uh, for Dan and Hiroshi is the following. <laughs> uh, okay. If you believe that the space-time is emergent, what would it mean to say that, to question whether the gauge field is emergent or not? Uh, no doubt the end of the story is that the space-time is also emergent, and possibly the ADS-CFT picture could be seen as proving that, but um, I think that wouldn't have told us that the CPN model was a better model than U1 gauge theory, and um, in U1 gauge theory there was a puzzle of how to reconcile the existence of the Wilson operator with the factorization of the Hilbert space, and I think that the idea of 
deriving it, uh, of deducing from it, that at a more microscopic level there wasn't really a U1 gauge field, was an advance. But for my purposes, I just found it very amusing that there was an analogy between the argument they made involving the tensor factorization of the Hilbert space between the two sides of the black hole and the fact in condenser matter, condensed matter physics that the Hilbert space should be locally factored in a way that would contradict the existence of gauge fields other than electromagnetism. So in condensed matter physics, we have to be able to interpret any uh, gauge field that we use in our models as being emergent somehow. Yes. Cycle. Yes. Some things were local in the yes. plaquette. Yeah. What happens if you dualize this model and turn the plaquettes into sites and the sites into uh, plaquettes? <laughs> uh, well, I'm not sure the terminology is the same as it is when people talk about du duality for the Ising, Ising model. But on the broader question, I don't know. There might be an interesting. Let's get to the picture. Yeah. I don't know what else the model is equivalent to. And the second question, I didn't quite understand whether you said that or you didn't. Is there a continuum Lagrangian that exhibits exactly the same phenomenon? Yes. Well, the, uh, well there's a description of this. The, the bulk phase can be described. Well, I, I hesitate to call it a dicraft written phase because we didn't envisage the application to condensed matter, but it can be described in our language. So because the bulk symmetry is on site, it can be gauged. And so you imagine coupling to Z2 background gauge fields. And then there's a non-trivial effective action in the presence of a background Z2 gauge field that you're familiar with. It's given by sine plus or minus one. And you can describe the boundary state in that language by explaining that the Z2 co-cycle is trivial when lifted to Z4. That's the when I said we were not going to take a tour through a group cohomology, that tour would have involved things like I just said. Okay, I think we don't have time for further questions. Let's thank the speaker again.